Thank you, Jen, and welcome everybody. We have a tremendous faculty for tonight's program. Our first speaker will be Catherine Everett, MD, MBA, FACR. Catherine is a summa cum laude graduate of Duke University with a degree in mathematics, and she received her MD degree at the University of North Carolina School of Medicine. She finished her residency and fellowship at UNC and entered private practice at Coastal Radiology in New Bern, North Carolina, where she is still working 40 years later. She is a long-term managing partner of the practice and she currently serves as president. Catherine served on the executive committee of the medical staff at Carolina East Medical Center for 16 consecutive years as both chair of the Department of Imaging and at-large member. She was the first and the only female chief of staff for her medical center. In 2010, Catherine received her MBA from Yale School of Management she then started volunteer work with the ACR and has served as president of the North Carolina chapter. She's also served on the council steering committee, as also has been chair of the economics committee of the GSER commission. And she is also chair of the steering committee of the senior retired section. Catherine is also currently a member of the board of chancellors. She's on the board of the American Association of Women Radiologists. Catherine is co-founder and president of Identico, a company which supplies a report library of template reports. Catherine's other interests include water skiing, wakeboarding, and I've seen her videos, she's really good, and gardening. She is also a 5.30 a.m. CrossFit fanatic. Dr. Jenny Hong, Hong excuse me, uh, is a professor of radiology, vice chair of radiology enterprise integration, medical director of Johns Hopkins outpatient sites. She graduated medical school at the University of Melbourne in Australia and completed diagnostic radiology residency at St. Vincent's Hospital in Melbourne. She subsequently completed fellowships in neuroradiology and cardiothoracic radiology at Duke University Medical Center, where she continued on as a faculty. She is a lifelong learner, completing a master's in health science at Duke University and also completing an executive MBA in 2019 at the Duke Fuqua School of Business. She has published more than 140 peer-reviewed articles with a focus on thyroid and parathyroid imaging. And she has helped lead the ACR efforts in producing a white paper on incidental thyroid findings and was a core member of the ACR TIRADS committee for thyroid ultrasound. She also serves on several ACR committees, including the incidental findings committee and the RADS working group. Our third speaker this evening, Dr. Andy Moriarty, received his undergraduate degree in biology and human physiology from Northern Michigan University and his MD degree from Wayne State University. He completed his residency in diagnostic radiology at Henry Ford Hospital and did a fellowship in abdominal imaging and cross-sectional IR at UCLA in Los Angeles. Dr. Moriarty is interested in healthcare policy and economics and served as the 2014 to 2015 chair of the ACR Resident and Fellow Section, the RFS. He has been published in numerous journals and his awards include the RSNA Rentgen Resident Research Award, the Karen J. Stuck Memorial Award for Outstanding Research by a Senior Resident, the Radiology Leadership Institute Annual Event Scholarship Award and the Musculoskeletal Division Best Case for the AIRP. Dr. Moriarty is board certified by the ABR and his professional memberships include the ACR, the SAR, Society of Abdominal Radiology, and the Michigan State Medical Society. It is quite a pleasure to have these three very uh, knowledgeable speakers for tonight's program. We will begin with Dr. Catherine Everett. Catherine? Okay, um, tonight I'd like to talk to you a little bit about what happens to radiology groups uh, with big mergers and acquisitions of major systems. And I'm gonna focus on what's been going on in my state because that's what I know the most about. Okay, we're back in our community hospital, happy radiology group. So you have subspecialist generalists, um, you staff a hospital and image center and your own imaging center, and you have full service breast imaging and our uh, fellowship trained RADS no neurointervention or pediatric radiologists, and you still have preliminary reports only for your um, uh, overnight work. All right, I'm not able to make it advance. 
So what are your strengths and weaknesses? You're established and respected in the community, strong breast imaging presence, dedicated IR services, which are all important for um, patient facing and community facing. You don't have neuro intervention, which is becoming fairly common in community hospitals, and you're still doing preliminary night reads. Next slide. So what are the threats and opportunities for your group? I'm going to focus primarily tonight on um, the threats. You can turn those into opportunities. The first um, is obviously direct competition. The second is if a big system comes in and acquires your system or a management contract. The third, which is less well um, developed at this point, are affiliations. And my hospital happens to have one of those. Next. So I'm going to focus on North Carolina. North Carolina has 100 counties, which is about 75 too many, and 87 of those counties have at least one hospital. There are four academic medical centers, and we're a strong CON state, which means that the facilities and equipment are heavily controlled financially. Next slide. So who are the big players? We have a large for-profit system in the western part of the state, about Mission Health, which is in the Asheville area. Similarly, we have Navant present in the uh, central state and in the east. We have some hybrid systems, Atrium Health, which is merged with Wake Forest Baptist Hospital, which is a teaching hospital, obviously, and then Vidant Health, which is a large community um, hospital system associated with East Carolina University. And then the third thing is the academic systems, which are pure academic, UNC and Duke. Next slide. So here's sort of um, where these systems sit. Um, Mission Hospital, Hospital Corporation of America in the western part of the state, uh, Wake Forest, Atrium, and Novant Forsyth, with that in, and Atrium includes Charlotte, that's in the Western Piedmont, Duke and UNC share the Eastern Piedmont, Vidant shares the poor Northeastern corner, and Novant has the Southeast, which is the beach area. Next slide. So what threats would radiology groups have? Direct competition, UNC Health built a new hospital in Hillsborough, which is north of Chapel Hill in 2015. These patients primarily were going to Duke and UNC, but, there were several smaller hospitals west and north of Hillsborough that are, were threatened by this new UNC hospital. Novant Health built a hospital in the Southeast Brunswick to compete with the one in Wilmington. And then everybody is putting outpatient imaging centers in everywhere. Next slide. Next threat two is actual acquisition or management contracts. UNC Health has been very aggressive in the state. They have acquired or have management contracts in 11 hospitals since 2000. The largest is a um, really big hospital in Raleigh, Rex Hospital with 560 beds and at least 14 imaging centers in the area. Certainly a threat to any radiology group that has a presence in that area. And um, UNC has either acquired or has contracts with several 100 or more bed hospitals many of which have private independent radiology practices. Next slide. So what happened to these radiology groups? The smaller hospitals um, that were part of medium sized, usually medium or large sized systems are pretty much as is. They were staffed by larger groups anyway. So far, the independent private practice groups in the intermediate size or larger hospitals are in place. But just recently, one group lost a contract and UNC placed that hospital under a different flagship hospital with shared staffing. Next slide. This is an example. Um, Wayne Memorial Hospital. I know most of you have heard of Kevin Cragen. He's a good friend of mine and he's in a radiology practice here. Six fellowship trained radiologists in a small town in Eastern North Carolina. Um, the group has a joint venture with Wayne Memorial for outpatient MR. They have a private outpatient center, and UNC acquired their contract in 2015. According to Kevin, the positives were they really pretty much left the radiologists alone, and they didn't try to undo the joint venture or the private practice center. Um, the negatives were um, the hospital board was pretty much replaced and therefore some of the local and UNC incentives were not aligned. 
particularly loss of service lines. And a big one for the radiology group is that UNC wanted to change the hospital PAC system. And the um, radiology group had invested a significant amount of money in their own PACs to match the hospitals. Future worries, they still have after hours coverage that's preliminary. They lack complete subspecialty coverage. And um, he's somewhat concerned, of course, about their joint ventures. Next slide. Duke Health, a little bit different. Um, they purchased Raleigh Community Hospital in 1998, and they have a rolling partnership with Duke Regional, which is in the same county as the, as the Duke primary campus. Next slide. So Duke Raleigh, basically the legacy group was replaced. Um, they, those that stayed came under contract with the Duke Radiology Department as employed physicians. There was some concession in terms of call. Um, much of their workflow has changed as the, um, it, a lot of offsite reading was done by subspecialists and the primary people on campus now are breast radiologists and IR. Uh, Duke Regional as of now is still independent and the radiologists at Duke Regional are listed on the Duke site as contractors. Next slide. Uh, second type of acquisition management contract that's a threat, Atrium Health merged with Wake Forest Baptist. Uh, Lynn Anthony, who's Senior Associate Dean for Faculty Affairs at Wake Forest, says that they intend to actually join those radiology groups under one umbrella, which will be, um, I think, quite an undertaking to um, put an employed faculty group with a private practice group that's partially owned by private equity. Next slide. And then the last, Hospital Corporation of America about, about Mission Health. Um, Brian Dickerson is president of Asheville Radiology, a very respected group. In his meeting with the CFO, CFO said, but Brian, it's about making money, isn't it? So you see the news in the spring this year, Mission, which was really a flagship hospital, has been downgraded by the LeapFrog group from A to B, but they're making money. Next slide. And one more quick one. This is a friend from Ohio, hospital system, three radiology groups. They said, you know, we only want to deal with one. Two of the groups agreed to merge or the third didn't and ultimately lost their contract. Next slide. One last, these are some additional sources, resources. One thing I absolutely think everyone on this call should do is listen to Jonathan Breslow's uh, podcast, Taking the Lead, Trading 90 Years of Independence for Employment. And it's, he discusses um, his group, the Sacramento group, losing the contract with Sutter Health and coming back two years later as employed physicians. Next slide. So a summary, know your group's strengths and weaknesses. Be aware of what's happening around you. Listen carefully. Johnny, Jonathan Breslow will tell you, you don't have the power you think you do. You may have to accept things you don't like, but consider the BATNA. Can you really live with what, what's out there? And then keep an open mind because things are changing. Next slide, that's the end. Thank you. Well, thank you, Catherine. I'll take it from here. Um, good evening, everyone. Thanks for being here. I'm going to start by saying that I would not have a job at Hopkins if not for consolidation and mergers. Uh, at Hopkins, I serve as the Vice Chair of Integration. Um, and tonight I'm going to give you the academic perspective of uh, consolidation on this topic. And my three uh, takeaways will be, why is this happening? What uh, is a success story that we have? And what are uh, the challenges and how you as radiologists and trainees can add value? Let me start from the beginning. February 1896, uh, that was the date of the first imaging study at Hopkins. And for more than a hundred years, uh, we practiced in a hospital uh, down in Baltimore city. And currently here is our clinical footprint. We uh, span two academic hospitals, uh, two community hospitals, uh, out in the National Capital Region or the NCR, and that's an hour and a half away from the academic hospitals. 
and then four outpatient sites out in the counties. And we have more than 70 academic radiologists and 20 community radiologists. Now this large footprint is not unique to Hopkins. And our next speaker, Andy Mariotti, is gonna tell you more about this, that our health care delivery system is consolidating. In 2020, this article outlined this. They spoke about how in 2003, just over 50% of community hospitals were affiliated with health systems. And in 2018, it was almost three quarters after 15 years. And more than 50% of US physicians are affiliated with one of just 637 health systems. So why, what's a success story and what are the challenges and how can you add value? So why? Uh, at a very high level, I'm reminded about, about a quote from a nun, which was no margin, no mission. Uh, and academic medical centers serve a critical role and have missions in research and educating our future generation of doctors and doing really cutting edge clinical care that unfortunately isn't particularly operationally efficient and doesn't generate a lot of profit. And for various reasons outside the scope of this uh, talk, uh, the, the margins are decreasing. And so the response of these academic medical centers are to become health systems and to grow. Now, growing affords economies of scale and scope, but growing into community hospitals also allows them to expand into new geographical areas and increase uh, market capitalization. In addition, community hospitals have a better payer mix, uh, less charity care, uh, and more uh, bread and butter uh, simple cases. And most of the time, um, in the examples that uh, Catherine's given, uh, radiology is just following along. They're not the initiators of these acquisitions of community radiology departments. They're just walking along to meet the needs of the parent enterprise. And so as we look down on this barrel of integration, um, the ideal is this situation where all the practices come together smoothly and quickly, and we're stronger together. Uh, that is the holy grail of m &As. And so I'm gonna share with you one success story uh, where together we did become more efficient and reduce costs. And so this is a question to you. How would you like to spend as a hospital 8.5 times less on iodinated contrast? Any hands? Yeah, maybe. Uh, so when I started in 2019, we looked at the ratio of Omnipeg to Visipeg across all of our hospitals. And as you know, Omnipeg is about three to four times less expensive than Visipeg. And we saw that uh, there were very much different ratios uh, due to different policies across the hospitals and different adherence to the policies. And there were actually different prices as each of these hospitals negotiated their contrasts. And the cost of VisiPeg was almost threefold difference between the less expensive hospital and the most expensive hospital. So what did we do? Uh, we set up a committee with uh, leaders in each of the subspecialties, and we agreed upon uh, a policy for when VisiPeg should be used. All of the hospitals adopted the policy, and then supply chain negotiated the prices as a system. And so you can see in green how much improvement there was at Johns Hopkins Hospital and at our outpatient center and all children's hospital completely converted to using Omnipaic almost entirely. And this was the hospital that benefited the most with an 8.5 times decrease in contrast spend in a year. Now there are other things to integrate. And I think of them as the five Ps uh, in radiology. There's the protocols, the platforms, that your PAC system, your dictation system, processes, policies, and the people. And so all of this happened long before I arrived at Hopkins and continues to happen with a great team. So I, I can't take uh, credit for the majority of this work, but this is what I've learned from the teams. Um, you have to know your organization, know what the mission is, and know why your customers come to you specifically and don't and stay true to that. Uh, next, when it's about acquisition of a community practice, uh, 
You need to, as Catherine said, know the strengths and weaknesses uh, and make sure that all costs you try and preserve value. Don't get it in the way of what's valuable. Stop, don't stop them from doing what is, is valuable. And finally, it's about bringing people together. Um, that's the leaders, but also uh, everyone under the umbrella and to create a community. So applying that to the most challenging of the five Ps, which is the people to integrate, uh, let's see how it goes. I strongly believe that you can't just slap on a sign on the door or on the front of the building and expect people to be teammates immediately. Uh, that comes with time and a good structure. And so I credit my current chair, Dr. Karen Horton, for, for this structure. So first of all, the model, what do you do with the radiologists uh, when you integrate? Well, she knew that what was called a Hopkins is our expertise. Um, and so she insisted on subspecialization uh, in the community radiologists that were integrated. But aside from that, uh, she left almost everything untouched. Uh, these radiologists still read at the same sites, and that was actually valuable. Uh, the reason it was valuable is because the providers at those community hospitals were very wary about Hopkins coming in and taking over. And so they were relieved to see the same radiologists at the end of the phone lines and in the reading rooms. Uh, also, the technologists at the sites were also very pleased with that. Uh, later on, these community radiologists helped with uh, marketing and outreach for our outpatient Bethesda site as well. Uh, the final goal as we work towards this is really getting the right study to the right radiologists and load balancing across the academic and community radiologists. Um, and as our community group became busier, uh, we've been able to um, help them and uh, take up more of the MSK oncology work, MSK MRI, um, some of the pediatric work and nuclear medicine work so that we're really even more specialized. And then finally about huddling and bringing people together. Uh, we have ongoing leadership meetings every two weeks uh, with the National Capital Region leaders and uh, our teams uh, that was set up by Dr. Ehab Kamel. And then our groups in quality and safety and policy integration uh, include the leaders, the managers uh, at all of the hospitals. Now, there's one thing that is missing here. Um, it's good and fair to get the leaders together in the same room, but what about the radiologists uh, hammering out the studies who were not at these leadership meetings? How do you make them feel like they belong to a community? Well, I was previously at Duke and I saw it happen with Duke Raleigh. Uh, we had their community radiologists rotate over into our reading rooms once a week. And so we got to know Bob and we got to know Mark and we had coffee with them and we got to know them as people and we felt like they belonged. Well, the challenge at Hopkins is that those community radiologists are one and a half to two hours away. We are never gonna be in the same reading room. So how do you do it? Well, the solution came in the form of a pandemic and a new application that we've used at Hopkins for the last year. Uh, and this is Microsoft Teams. Uh, and I write Microsoft Teams, it, it's just an application. It's available on desktop and devices. It's really what you do with it. So what did we do with it? Well, we created a team called the Radiology Virtual Department, and its members are the research faculty, the clinical faculty, our community radiologists, and all of our trainees. And I could speak to you uh, about this for more than an hour uh, because um, I, I sing a blessing to Microsoft frequently, uh, but um, this is the organization. We have channels, and in each channel represents either divisions or interest groups. Uh, or uh, links to policies or reporting resources and IT. And in these channels uh, is information. Uh, so we have the division schedules, we have um, meeting uh, conference links. Uh, there are notes about the division and educational resources in addition to phone numbers. So information all in one place. And then we meet, um, you can see that we're hosting a cocktail hour here. Uh, in Teams, but uh, when we're doing virtual readouts, and even though we're uh, we're, sp we're in the same room, we, we try and space out. So we're doing reads within the division. And the advantage of this over Zoom is that other people can see that you're there. Visibility is really important and they can join the meeting at any time. 
And then the part that I'm most proud of uh, with my department is their engagement uh, on this platform. And it's become our department water cooler, virtual water cooler, where we have conversations. Uh, under the post section, we recognize faculty and other people give people thumbs ups and love hearts for their good work. And so it's rec about recognizing people and knowing members of your team and, and having gratitude and being proud. Uh, and then we have chats and this is where inclusion is important. I set up a chat with all of the neuroradiologists, including the community neuroradiologists in, at Thanksgiving last year. And over um, you know, the last nine months, we've just had so many conversations ranging from uh, getting second opinion on cases. Um, we just copy and paste the image onto the chat and people chime in and it's like polling um, the, 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 the wisdom of the group. Uh, people make decisions on Teams. We poll uh, with the feature of Microsoft on Teams. Uh, we share um, celebrations, happy birthday. Everyone gives a thumbs up, sings out happy birthday and good wishes. We, sh we celebrate holidays uh, in this chat. Uh, and then finally, we've shared pictures and parts of ourselves. And this is about getting to know people that you can't be in the same room with. So I'm going to end off with this a quote that just makes me so happy because it's hard to me measure community and culture. But this is a quote from one of our community and neuroradiologists. Uh, they say about teens, we've uh, definitely got uh, a much better sense of what's going on in the department and we feel connected. And so uh, I summarise by saying that uh, we've talked about why it's happening. I've shared a success story about integration and I shared with you some tips on how to build a community when you're far apart. Thank you. Hey everybody, thanks for that. Um, I'm Andy Moriarty. I am the VP of operations at my group here in advanced radiology services in Grand Rapids, Michigan. I'm also the ACR YPS member to the, the board of chancellors. And I serve many of you as the uh, ACR representative, alternate representative to the RUC. So kind of think about this from some payment policy perspective. And that's kind of where my slides start. But I wanted to encourage everyone to think about sending in some questions to the Q&A box so we can have a lively discussion afterwards. I'll go quick on a quick so we can <clears throat> sort of save some time in the end for the Q&A and um, looking forward to that. So my, my background is kind of payment policy and you talk about you know, who's the big $600 billion elephant in the room? It, it's Medicare, right? And that's that's who provides a lot of the healthcare for the, for the country and it's kind of projected to get even bigger. But you can't forget about all of the private payers, right? There are a number of large insurance organizations. Um, for example, United there provides, uh, has about $100 million marketization capitalization. They have about 300,000 employees and you know, they do $250 billion in revenue covering four, 45 million lives. So you can see the logos of many of the companies there. You know, my, my company up there in the top right is about the similar size, but I can guarantee you that we don't really have the same negotiating clout uh, when, you, when you put us uh, in the same room with some of these companies. But what's been interesting is that over the very recent history, a number of these large organizations have just been getting bigger. They've been merging with themselves to create larger health insurer conglomerations, as well as doing vertical integrations about cross, spanning across, across multiple organizations, including pharmacy benefit management, the provider organizations in some aspects. And you know, when you talk about what is driving all this, well, it's that you've seen when insurers can consolidate, they have more market power, and they uh, have been doing studies where they show that they can actually negotiate around 12% lower payments from hospitals and providers when they have a dominant market power. Now, the corollary to that is it's driving mark consolidation within the hospital systems to better compete with them, as well as amongst radiologists or other hospital, other physician groups. And we see that with the declining number of independent hospitals and the increase is part of a hospital system. I show this slide really just to say that, you know, some hospitals say, well, we're, we're going to be remain independent, we're going to remain small. And I think this the graph kind of shows that if you're not already part of a larger system, you're probably on someone's radar somewhere. There was a, a look at the acquisition of 
physician practices outside of hospital ownership. So groups that became employed through outside investment, seeing a significant trend from 2013 to 2016. And they talked about some of the practice, or at least these are outside of radiology, obviously, but they talked about the growing trend in cardiology, ophthalmology, and radiology. And the, the characteristics of these practices tended to be smaller. They had an average of four sites. They had 16 physicians per site. And the majority of them, as you can see down there, were in the South. The organization that takes care of our radiology training, or sorry, the all of residency training has actually also weighed in on this. And they believe that there will be significant consolidation by the year 2025. When they published this in 2017, I think they were kind of getting it right on the money. I'll highlight one of those there. It says that the trends here over the next decade will be democratization, commoditization, and corporatization of medical services. And that's something that they said they should be teaching the trainees as they're going through. So what does it look like outside of radiology? It's just a long-term trend of increasing consolidation and growth, especially over mergers, acquisitions. It's been going on for multiple, multiple years not necessarily limited to one place, right? It's not private practice only, it's not academic centers. It's has been discussed in the previous two speakers. There's, there's a lot of going on in every sort of niche of the market right here. So it, what do we talk about specifically in radiology? Well, have we seen all this before in the past, right? There, there was these things called physician practice management companies that happened in the late 90s and kind of had a, a falling out when they, they realized that they're the need for capital wasn't really the only thing that they were bringing to the table. They just did not have the, the management experience that the, the physician owners and the hospital leaders had in that. So I think the lesson to take away there from was, you know, you can't abdicate your business decisions just by merging and getting larger. Um, to speak to my own personal experience, I work in Grand Rapids, Michigan. It's the center of the picture there. And the, the top picture is the signing of the entity that formed was called Spectrum Health in my area. That was formed in 1997. They actually had to get a special consent decree from the US District Court to approve the merger of Butterworth and Blodgett Hospitals, two facilities that had operated 10 miles apart from each other for over a hundred years. At that time, they were serviced by two radiology groups um, that decided to merge along with that to perform, to perform, to create advanced radiology services. But as you can see on the right half of your screen, over the next 20 years, Spectrum Health would grow to become a $8 billion corporation that employs almost 5,000 physicians and has about a million lives in their insurance product. Well, we've grown right along with them. And when we started, we were a group of 10 and 13 radiologists. When I joined six years ago, we were about 120. We're now about 170 radiologists performing or servicing about 2 million exams across the, the year. And what we found is remaining independent really worked well to us to partner not only with uh, the growth of our large institutions, but to provide services to multiple small geographies and hospitals throughout the state that would otherwise not have that same level of subspecialty care. Um, our newest partnership there on the right was announced with Michigan State University. We had grown that organically through an existing relationship at the hospital. And when they were looking for a way to grow their presence throughout the state as a land grant university, they came to us and said, is there a way that we can partner to expand the scope of clinical services and sort of really unify the care across a very large geographic area in our entire state to bring care to those patients? You know, what, what is happening in the larger context outside of Michigan, right? We, we've seen Radiology Business Journal talk about consolidation in, in uh, radiology practices. They were, they were tracking the largest 50 groups, and then they said, well, they're getting bigger and more numerous, and they're up to 100, and then all of a sudden, many, many groups are coming together. And they're saying that this is probably a sustained trend. We haven't seen one of these surveys recently, but... We did do a, we did uh, at the GACR published that there's definitely been a trend toward fewer and bigger groups over time. And there really hasn't been much study on the cost quality and patient access of these groups. But you can see in the bottom right, the, the largest growth was in those groups of 100 to 500 radiologists. So kind of back to my personal example, right? Spectrum Health has grown. We've grown along with them in the last 20 years. And just a couple of months ago, they 
announced that they were in plans to merge with Beaumont Hospital, which is one of the larger hospital systems on the east side of the state. You can see there at the, the bottom of the quote that this would create a $13 billion healthcare company. And you know how big is too big? Well, maybe when your hospital merger reaches the national NPR newsletter, you, you get some attention from uh, large regulators. So that's my presentation. I'm happy to talk about our experience and some of the challenges that we've faced as a, a private practice group integrating not only across a large geographic area, but across multiple different health systems, integrating groups that wanted to join and benefit from that economy of scale and how do we provide services as, as a large independent private practice group. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you to our, our speakers for their excellent talks and insight on this important topic. Uh, we're now gonna move on to the Q&A session. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, to ask a question, you would go to, as we're showing here on the screen, the Zoom control panel, click on this Q&A icon, up comes the window, you type your question and hit submit, and then I will ask your question for you. So we have had a few questions slash comments that have rolled in. Um, the first one is a comment. Um, not sure if this is a question as much as an observation. It is possible for independent radiology practices to collaborate to provide a single contract, but still not merge. Practices need to make themselves aware of this possibility and the benefits this approach would bring to groups and their ability to maintain a great deal of independence while still jointly fulfilling demands of a multi-facility system. Um, would any of our speakers like to comment about that? I'm trying to read that if anyone wants to perp in, it says it provide a single signatory contract and still not merge. I think I'll speak to that in the sense that for the first 10 years of ARS, we did operate similar to, um, I would think similar to that mechanism. We had one tax ID, but sort of multiple regions throughout the group. And because our largest areas of business were concentrated in around 50% of the group, there were other regions that felt that there was a lack of integration and consolidation. We actually hired an outside consultant to bring to the group and talk about how you integrate that culture. And I think that was kind of pressing it 10 years ago. The, the consultant mentioned that one of the biggest things to do is you have to really be all in or all out. You can't have one foot out the door. So we embarked on a long, long couple of year run to not only fully integrate all the groups into one PAC system and under one sort of unified mm -hmm. clinical services architecture, but we broke down some of those silos about this is my small community hospital and I, I will read all those studies and then they will have the, the teleradiology remote support or something like that. So we found that you really don't get the benefits of scale and the sense of belonging until you really commit to being one integrated group. And that goes back to, to Jenny's presentation too, I think. And I, I would just comment that not only do you have to be all in, you also have to be all financially in because it's, it's expensive when you try to put multiple groups together with multiple platforms, with different night call services, et cetera. If you aren't committed to doing it and committed to paying for it, it isn't gonna work. Um, you can look through the ACR and go back. There are multiple areas that have tried it. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so here's our next question. Um, in your opinion, what happens to low pain subspecialties like pediatric radiology in this new world of mergers and acquisitions? Uh, I'll, I'll kick us off for the rest of the panel. I mean, I, I think that the, the question kind of leads you along when it says low paying subspecialties. And so we're, what we're really talking about is studies or subspecialties that have a disproportionate lower RVU calculation compared to what others can be done. And you know, to their credit, the RVU system is not perfect, but they do a good job of balancing across different medical subspecialties. And sometimes you get it wrong. One thing that my group has done is, is we've internally weighted things. I think you know the, the quote from our president is great. You know, at our scale and our size, 
you're never going to have the same job. You're not, we're not all equal in the sense that there's a, a 12 person radiology group where everybody just reads down the list, the oldest to newest, and there's no subspecialization. But what we try to do is make everything fair. We delegate that to the clinical sections and we recognize that there is just one pile of radiology studies coming in and we have to divvy up the work that is appropriate for a, a nice work-life balance and so the radiologists don't feel overburdened. And that that might mean that there are perceptions about people's RVU generation, but that doesn't mean that you're working harder or less hard compared to some of your colleagues. We have really have to take it on ourselves to develop a framework that feels fair to, across all of the organization. Any other comments from our faculty? Um, it, it, absolutely, it's true. Uh, groups, I, there are groups in North Carolina that have had real issues with their contracts because they were unable to provide pediatric services. It, same thing is true with IR. You have to look at what the service provides for you, the safety it provides for you, the comfort it provides for you. And like Andy says, things are not, RVUs are not the holy grail. You have to figure out within your group what's important and value it that way. You can't just look at the monetary value of an RVU. Pediatrics and IR are particularly um, under that radar. Well, I'd say it's a little different in academics. Um, everyone gets a base salary and then um, the bonus system is based on some thresholds and for different divisions um, that have um, wide ranging RVUs, um, that, that threshold is different. So pediatrics is different to the neuroradiology threshold. Okay, our next question is for Dr. Moriarty. Um, given the current size of your group, have you had any luck with improving contractual relationships with payers? Yeah, oh, so to the previous question about pediatric radiology, I mean, one of the things that we've found as a benefit is at about our size, we are really at the size where we can, we can provide 24 seven subspecialty pediatric radiologists and kind of keep those pediatric radiologists busy all throughout the day. I think Dr. Warren talked about that with consolidating nuclear medicine and across sites. Um, to the question about current size and contract relationships with the group, absolutely. That is one of our value propositions when we discuss hospital contracts and payer contracts is because of the size and scale of our organization, you will get a robust quality system and subspecialty interpretation that you just could not possibly get in a smaller group where we can have those those pediatric CAQ trained, fellowship trained radiologists available 24 seven. We have a, a level one pediatric hospital here in Grand Rapids and they, the volumes that they have couldn't support that except for at the scale that we are across the state. Any of our faculty want to respond in addition to that? I think Dr. Wong's presentation mentioned that, you know, they did have some, some savings from their scale too. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, you know, I, I'm, my group is part of radiology partners and certainly radiology partners has been able to, because of size, been able to um, have some interesting contracts related to metrics, um, which are very good. Yeah, and what we did for contrast can pro procurement uh, is the same for, for capital and equipment um, and the, the contracts around that equipment. Okay, um, our next question. Um, what do you think the impact on these M&A trends will be on trainees applying for jobs soon? Uh, I'll, I'll kick us off. I, I think this and the next question are related about uh, graduating people entering the job market. And then there's a sub question about academic radiology, but I, I talked to, we have trainees at one of our, at multiple of our sites actually. And I talk to our trainees all the time that the most important thing is to, to ask questions and to know exactly what you're getting into when you sign your job. I mean, my group is a private practice and we definitely have a, a different 
mentality and mindset towards some of the some of the nuances of practice building and work life balance. But at the end of the day, you know, we, we talk about being democratic and we are a 200 person organization. So if you become a partner in my group, you get one vote out of out of 200 and we do what's best for the group. But fortunately, what's best for the group is also, you know, the for the shareholders of the group, which happen to be the radiologists. But um, when I graduated, my one of my friends contemplated taking a job back in his hometown where there was a single radiologist in practice serving a hospital. And he was told, yes, well, if you come on, then there'll be two of us and we can take Q2 call instead of me taking Q1 call. <laughs> and the guy said, well, you know, that means that you have 26 weeks off a year. And if you want to take more vacation, you'll have to have to pay a locums to come to you. But I don't I don't think that those jobs will, will tend to be around in this in this era of mergers and acquisitions, you know, I, like I said in my hospital consolidation slide, the the facilities themselves are contracting with larger organizations, and they expect alignment, whether that's across a, a large group or employment within the hospital system and the health system, so that you can really drive that healthcare according to what the hospitals need to do. can take the question about uh, Florence is uh, interested mm -hmm. in academic radiology uh, and was interested in how this would be changing academic practice uh, long term. Uh, so I'd say that uh, at, at Duke uh, and, and, and to some degree at Hopkins, it meant that we were reading academic radiologists weren't just reading the most complex um, neck eating tumors. Um, we we're reading pretty basic uh, cases, which was, uh, you know, a nice uh, balance throughout the day uh, because we we're reading at, at Duke Raleigh's as a outpatient MRIs. Um, in terms of um, sort of academic uh, balance of clinical uh, research teaching, I think it gives you, gives you more flexibility to have a bigger pool of radiologists and to um, load balance, uh, particularly during those uh, meeting, academic meetings that everyone wants to attend, having community radiologists helping out uh, with the schedule during those times was uh, really helpful, again, uh, at Duke when I was there. And actually, our next question is for Dr. Hong as well. Um, you mentioned Hopkins has an emphasis on subspecialization, even in the community. How have the community general radiologists adapted to that change? And so the community general radiologists had to choose uh, their, their body region. And so there were no longer radiologists reading head CTs and uh, CT abdomens on call. Uh, they, they, they had to choose uh, between the two. Um, um, and that, that did result uh, certainly in some difficulties in covering the, the call schedule um, when you, you know, previously had one person covering all of the ED. Uh, now you had to have your neuroradiologist and, and your body imager as well. Mm -hmm. uh, tagging on to that, we, we've kind of taken a slightly different approach at, at my group. Uh, we, we do consider ourselves subspecialized, but I like to tell people who come to work here to interview or to ask questions is, we, we want everybody to have one core subspecialty, but then usually something else that you're proficient at, you plus one. It, it helps even at a group of our size with the, um, the amount of vacation and sick call coverage where we can have a little bit of flexibility. So we, we tend not to have people spending 100% of their time in a subspecialty area with the exception of neuroradiology and peds, which can provide sort of internal coverage, but we have ER radiologists who can also work in the body subspecialty area or the MSK radiologists who can work in ER, things like that. Our breast radiologists are approaching 100%. Some of them actually prefer to keep up some general skills and work in the ER. And then some of our smaller sites actually have what Dr. Pyatt would call multi-specialty radiologists, someone who does a lot of general work uh, very well and very proficiently and can handle procedures and fluoro studies and a, a whole wide gamut of general radiology, but with the support of the subspecialty interpretations uh, through the teleradiology platform. So, you know, I really think there's, there's definitely gonna be a role for that, at least at some of the smaller hospitals, because you can't really have a super subspecialized on-site model where you have a, a breast imager and an interventional radiologist on-site every single day at, at, num at a number of these hospitals, just based on geography. Any other comments about subspecialization? 
just to add to what Andy says, um, 80% of the hospitals in this country are under 300 beds. So if you think about that and you're running a radiology practice and it's the business, you can't put an IR and a breast radiologist there every day, plus somebody else who can, you know, take care of the ED. You, you have to have, um, there has to be still what we call a generalist, um, multi-specialty radiologists like Dr. Pyatt's article just came out with, there's still a huge place for that in this country, mm -hmm. even in large groups and academic practices. Okay, next question. Do you think if you are a larger group, should you directly approach smaller groups? And if so, how, how should you do that? Can I take that one? <laughs> sure. Go for it. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm the, I, we were the other way around. We were a smaller group talking to larger groups. But um, the answer is yes, because just for just what I just said, if you want to expand your group, I'm going to use Greensboro Radiology as an example. Um, very um, well-respected group in North Carolina, and they have acquired a lot of hospital contracts. And what they ran into was... Um, their subspecialists, again, they didn't have anybody in their practice who could go to Franklin, do a breast biopsy, put in a PICC line, and, you know, read the neuro case of the, of the ED of the day. They didn't have those people um, because their whole group is pretty much subspecialized. So, um, you know, there is still some value. And if you're going to talk to a smaller a hospital with a small group, talk to the group. They're valuable to you. Any other comments? So I may have the uh, the inverse perspective of a, of a large academic center, but and I don't know the history of my group that well before the most recent five to six years. But we're fortunate enough that uh, we don't actually approach smaller groups. We we have wait for people or hospitals to approach us. We have a, a line of people sort of waiting for our technological implementation to to be able to do that. And I would say that that comes from the recognizing the, the value that we can provide to small groups. So we specifically don't try to get take hospital contracts or to directly approach small groups. It's, we work by word of mouth and find people who want to join us. And I think that's one of the real important parts about integration is you have to find somebody who wants to be your partner rather than saying, well, th th there's a change of the signage out front. And now we need to figure out how to make this work is, um, that's just been our approach. Uh, and, and can I just say, I, if I was, mis I was misleading about Greensboro, that was not their approach. These, these were hospitals that were acquired by their system. And all I was saying, in fact, you know, my small group talked to multiple larger groups in our state, um, hoping we could join just like Andy was talking about. And uh, the small practices is doing that. The, the thing is to remember that they are important. What their skill set is still important. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, next question. Will mergers and the practice of general radiology as subspecialists take over most of the diagnostic radiology? I think Dr. Everett and I agree, no. <laughs> Any other comments? Okay, next question is for Dr. Moriarty. Um, how have you managed affiliations with new groups that have much lower RVUs or revenue productivity? Uh, well, that, that is always tricky, right? That goes back to culture and integration and getting everyone to feel like they're the same team. So when you do join the group, we, we look at, like I said, not how to make everybody equal, but how to make the, the workday fair. And one of the benefits of complete integration is you no longer have the differences in payer contracts and things like that. You get standard protocols, you get uh, you know, the standard from the, from the group. And then we work to make the, the individual shifts fit within somewhere in a model. So I, I don't know how to say it about a lower of your productivity. I think that that is going to be, there's a bell-shaped curve of radiologists and you have to figure out, well, where do people fit? I don't think that people are universally lower when they're looking to join a different group, but that has to be 
assessed more on an individual basis once you define how the, the productivity expectations are fair for everybody in your group who could potentially fulfill that role. Mm -hmm. Any other comments? Well, I think fairness leads into the next question, uh, which is, uh, in a blended academic private group, how do you assess individual radiologists' productivity? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I think that uh, well, you can't possibly have the same uh, compensation and you can't expect to be reading the, the same uh, volume. So uh, at Hopkins, uh, the community radiologists and academic radiologists, uh, that, that part of the compensation is different. Um, and, I see, and that's really, can be a source of friction uh, and the importance of getting to know each other in community because the community radiologist is gonna say, you have all this time and I'm you know, reading um, through my nose. And then the academic radiologist is saying, you get paid so much more and I'm almost reading the same as you. Um, and so uh, that, that can be uh, challenging. Um, but to answer Lynn's question, um, um, it's still based on RVU with a base salary and, uh, and, in, and a bonus system. But they, they have both aspects have to be different. Okay, so we're just a, a minute past the hour and to be respectful of everyone's time, we're gonna go ahead and um, end the Q&A session. Uh, so I'm now going to turn things over to Dr. Pyatt to conclude the webinar. Dr. Pyatt. Thank you, Jen. And we would like to thank our faculty this evening for all their knowledge and experience. Drs. Everett, Dr. Hong, and Dr. Andy Moriarty, thank you. And we also thank you, members of this audience, for attending this program. Please share your feedback with us. We will be sending a post-webinar survey and the recording of tonight's program out next week. You are welcome to share this with your colleagues in your practice. The next part our topic will be how we started in quality improvement, individual stories, this will be on September 22nd from 7 to 8 p.m. Eastern Time. You can register for this and other free RLI Power Hour webinars at the website that you see on the screen here, www.acr.org slash Power Hour. Again, thank you everyone for attending and thank you to our faculty. Good evening.